Great. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, thank you, colleagues, for, for coming along to this session. This, as we know, is a paper being jointly, jointly written by myself. And now I think I'm representing Landwood Research and Chris Doerr of Heritage Business International. Chris is here in the, in, in the cloud. So I will actually do the presenting, but Chris will be here to uh, help when we move on to questions. Okay. The big picture problem is that since 2020, archaeology has been so busy. Since the start of the pandemic, in the United States and in the United Kingdom, archaeology has been so busy. There has been so much demand. And there have been unprecedented levels of hard-to-fill vacancies. And so we are in a situation a situation we've never been in before, where there is a mismatch between supply and demand for the workforce. And we're also at a, point, at a time where there are changing attitudes and people's feelings about work and the nature of work and the nature of work in archaeology are changing. The, I'd also just like to very briefly say it was good to see a, a different picture of this same site in uh, one of Taryn's slides, it's Constitution Street in, in Edinburgh, which is near where I grew up. And I always thought it was the most boring of streets to walk along, a boring big blank wall at one side. And you take that wall down and you find that the cemetery spills out under the road. And it's um, an, a great photo, I think, of socially distanced excavation in process. OK, so back to just thinking about demand. Demand for archaeology, demand for construction-led, development-led, compliance-led archaeology is pretty much entirely driven by the cyclical nature of the construction industry, in my opinion. And that's especially thinking about housing. But strangely, in this last couple of years, it's been a lot thinking about big, large-scale infrastructure projects. And so sometimes this, no, always, when there's demand from construction, there is demand for archaeology. And it's been particularly intense in this last two years. Remember here we're talking both about in the United States and in the United Kingdom. The governments in, on both sides of the Atlantic have protected construction as an industry. And so in this country, there was absolutely no way that construction was going to be allowed to stop because of the pandemic. And archaeology had to make very sure that we were not the ones causing, our, causing construction to stop. So. Then just to think about supply, the important thing here is that archaeology is part of the knowledge industry. And so this means that archaeological employers want to have knowledge-focused workforces. And this means that the, the simplest and easiest way to equate to that is that they seek, seek to have graduate workforces. And that's meant that, yeah, historically, Graduates have been expected to fill vacancies in, in archaeology. And the number of people, still the number of people here and the number of people in the United States who are getting degrees in archaeology or in anthropology as archaeology is a part of in the States, far exceeds the number of, of vacancies we have in, in archaeology. There, are, there has been occasional complaints about lack or lack of quality of supply from the universities. I think that is quite possibly rather unfair to be thinking about that. Another thing that has come out in this last two years in here in pandemic times, there has been a re-reckoning thinking about work. People, people are thinking about more about what they want from work. Individual people have different attitudes from the way that was widespread before the, in the before times. And this has then had the consequence throughout the white collar knowledge economy in the global north of the phenomenon which is being called the great resignation. About people, and it, great resignation is not just about people quitting jobs, it's about difficulty in recruiting to jobs. So very much a time of reevaluation, changing attitudes to work, changing attitudes of the generation that are coming in to work in archaeology who are expecting, wanting, wanting something different from their work, from what we of the, this, this, this gray-haired generation thought we were getting when we first got into archaeology. So 
thinking about archaeology in the UK, just to remind you, statistics from Profiling the Profession, these data were collected at March 2020, so just on the cusp of the pandemic. This is where we were then. There are maybe 7,000 people who work in UK archaeology, equating to 6,300 full-time equivalent jobs, and the kind of jobs those are. There, if you look at the, the biggest chunk there are people working in commercial archaeology, and then next to that are the people advising local government. So that makes up 75% of professional archaeologists are working in development-led archaeology in the UK. The, now, this is then going to use revenue as a proxy for, for demand. The four biggest companies in UK archaeology, biggest companies by the number of people that work for them and the amount of money flowing through those companies, are Amola and Oxford Archaeology and Wessex Archaeology and Cotswold Archaeology. And very usefully to be able to get good data out, they're all charities, and so they report, they provide annual reports to the Charities Commission. So unlike with private companies, we can see what their turnovers were. We can see what, where the money came from and what it got spent on. That's what it looked like just before the pandemic. They're, those four companies between themselves, half of the, the revenue going through UK archaeology was going through them. They, so 60 million pounds going through them. And over those four year, that one year, those four companies in total on aggregate actually made a loss. So archaeology was being, although to us it's a lot of money, it was not actually being very profitable. I was just going to say, please, please do keep continue to snap images. Um, if, when we're finished, if anyone wants a copy of all the notes and slides, Chris and I are very happy to share that with anyone who wants to see this. We're, we're hoping to get this published in different places, but th th we can provide full pre-publication notes. So that's where we were just before the pandemic. And so now we've had access to the figures from the first year of the pandemic. So the situation as it was a year later in March 2021, and remembering, remembering what it was like, remembering what it was like back in, in March 2020 when we were panicking and we had no idea what was going to happen. And archaeology, archaeology thought, is it going to be 2008 again? Are we going to have a, a crisis like that? We're certainly going to have a crisis. But no, we didn't. And because of construction being protected and so many big projects getting launched and keeping running, the amount of money that flowed through those four big charities went up by an enormous amount. And it increased there, an increase of more than a quarter in terms of revenue, and indeed a little bit of surplus coming out of that. So archaeology was changed, changed by the pandemic and changed by, remarkably, the most important publications for archaeology in, in recent years have been the Construction Leadership Council guides that have been telling construction how to keep working safely, and so archaeology could keep working. And so there continued to be demand for archaeological work. Now then, back to thinking, with, that's demand for archaeological work and supply. Thinking about, if we just talk about graduates, and there's lots of talk about different archaeology departments, university departments being in trouble and there being less graduates coming through. Actually, the Higher Education Statistical Authority produces now at last produces good figures that you can actually get real numbers about the number of people being enrolled on archaeology courses as postgrads and undergrads. It's been around 5,000 people have been students at any given time over the last five years. And I reckon that this means that there's about more than 2,000 graduates coming out every year. And remembering the size of the workforce, if they all wanted jobs in archaeology, then the whole population would get replaced every three years. But there is so much demand for staff. In, at the start of April, at the start of April 2022, there were no jobs at all advertised for field workers on Badger. For those of you that know Badger, uh, online jobs uh, bulletin board. No jobs at all. And speaking to David Connolly at Badger, that had never, ever happened before. We were in panic mode. And then very quickly, we were out of panic mode. And by the time we get to June, lots of the big companies are placing lots of adverts for field workers. And a remarkably, Headland Archaeology put this advert out calling for they wanted at least 100 new people. And as it says, it was um, they, they would ideally you will have had commercial experience. They were they were they were 
desperate to recruit, and all the big firms were desperate to recruit, and have been for this last you know, two years. So we're in a position in UK archaeology where I reckon now, just, just here at March this year, I think there are at least 11 com companies that employ more than 100 people each, or 100 archaeologists each. There are unprecedented levels of hard to fill vacancies. We've never, no, we have never seen a situation like this. There has been a reset in attitudes and maybe that it means that what is being offered is not appealing to those potential entrants to the, to the sector. Of course, again, in, in a different kind of before time, there was a time when there was, there was a different pool of potential new employees that, we could, that the companies could tap and were able to at times when, at busy times, when we could be recruiting lots of, relatively lots of, Polish and Spanish and Irish, actually Irish are easier still to work, but in Swedish archaeologists than we than before. And that tap has been turned off. And this means that the employers are having to change their focus and are having to think of the big employers are thinking about training people on the job by setting up their own graduate and non-graduate training programs. Okay, that's the picture in the UK which might be quite familiar to to most of you. I don't think there were too many surprises in there. In the United States, okay, what do we know about the United States and the, the information there? The, we think that commercial archaeology is uh, an annual market that's worth there. That's the number in pounds, 750 million pounds, a, a billion dollars, let's say. There's a lot more companies than there are in British archaeology and they are much more widely distributed, and what we're calling scientific staff, yeah, we can equate that to being archaeologists working in professional commercial archaeology in the United States. The distribution of archaeologists is different. Remember, we've got 75% of people here working in development-led archaeology. Actually, in the United States, a lot more people, archaeologists, are in academe or are working for... Um, for different agencies that are outside the development-led, compliance-led work. But big, big chunk in commercial archaeology. The size of the, uh, the archaeological market over time has been growing. Now, you have to recognize that this graph, this is a graph that isn't five minutes. Hmm. Got more than five minutes sometime. <laughs> right, five quick minutes. Right, there we go. U USA commercial archaeology, big thing, grew a lot from 1970, but hasn't actually really grown in real terms very much since 1990s. Uh, here, there we go. Percentage change year on year. The important thing, the important point, this point, is that there have been two very big deal acts passed. The Great American Outdoors Act of 2020 and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act of 2021. We think that this is actually going to generate lots more need for archaeological jobs. We think overall maybe 5,000 new jobs in the next five years. And American archaeology, like British archaeology, is struggling to recruit right now. And there is going to be so much more demand coming up very soon. The interesting point that we want to focus on here is thinking about where, where in the workforce we need to be thinking specifically about, the, about project labor and counting problems. Maybe ACRA, American Cultural Resources Association, reckons that 42% of the people working in, let's call it commercial archaeology in the United States, are field technicians, techs. The, these people are yeah, there might maybe be 3,700 active techs. Typically, these are people who have a bachelor's degree and have gone through field school training after graduation. And they don't always get counted in the big counts of how many people are working for the, these companies. They are in precarious employment. They are in turn. They are moving from place to place, from project to project. They are on low pay. They are not getting the kind of benefits that permanent contracts uh, provide. And there's a, yeah, we're saying there's a common belief, 
for which there's little data and which we think is wrong, that these people work for a few years and then go back to school to get a master's. Because once you've got a master's, then you become a registered professional archaeologist, or you can, and you've, your career prospects change. Um, we don't think this is quite this is quite right. We don't think this is what is happening, and we think that the techs are underappreciated by the firms because these people aren't getting additional benefits. These people, uh, they, their work is essentially 100% billable. If they're not working, they're not getting paid, and the companies have become financially dependent on the, sp on the work of the ar ar archaeological technicians. That given the, this business model that we're all working under of selling labor hours. The, we reckon that, so, Archaeology United States is going to need another 1,000 people, people every year. And historically, there has been quite a lot of finger pointing. And we do this here, and I do it here, but where we blame the universities. Universities are not, not producing the right people. They're not telling people about what, what real world archaeology is like. And that, in the United States, is a fallacy because essentially all graduate students and all junior academic staff have now gone through CRM, Cultural Resources Management, have worked in commercial archaeology. They know what it, it's like. Okay, maybe the senior people haven't, but the universities know what the world is like. Still in the UK, I think we do still have a problem, and I still think there is a problem of, of universities not fully appreciating what the world of work in archaeology is like. But the, nowadays, most people have a, a pretty, in the United States, have a pretty good understanding of what's likely to be coming up after university. There's a quick graph of the number of people getting degrees in the United States. Again, so many, so much more than, the, than a natural replacement rate would require. But we, um, yeah, we think what, what was those last numbers were coming out at saying there's maybe 10,000 graduate, 10,000 degrees being awarded every year, and we need a thousand new people coming into work every year. Um, we're in such such a different and unexpected situation. The it is Chris and I w would argue that it actually the firms need to look at themselves. The commercial companies need to think about this rather than trying to find ways to blame external outside agencies for their their woes in recruitment. They need to think about a new business model where they can be profitable and grow value. And to do that, we argue that the way to do that is to invest in the careers of those people at entry level, the people in junior positions. Because at the moment, back to what the whole point of the whole title of the proposal of the paper, we say we don't have a jobs problem, there's clearly lots and lots of jobs. And also there are clearly lots and lots of people that could do those jobs, but we have a careers problem because we as employers are not investing enough in those people to actually turn what their opportunities are into being truly careers, because an anthropology degree in the United States can get you lots of good jobs, lots of different good jobs, and they are better, by different metrics, they are better jobs than in archaeology. They are better paid, there is more, there is more security, there is more opportunity for development. So we, we, have, we have come to this position without quite realizing that it was going to come, that we weren't properly appreciating that field techs and junior field workers here were burning themselves out and, and leaving because, all right, maybe we knew that because people disappeared, but you know, another one will be along in a minute. There was always a sense that this wasn't actually a problem. And now, this, the world that we're in right now, the, the demand that's come through COVID, combined with the changing attitudes of people to the world of work, especially, as I say, the, the newer generation coming in has completely changed the situation. To conclude, so the last five minutes now then, yeah? The overall, COVID-19 has led to an, a big increase in revenue, big increase in revenue, but it's also led to a, a concomitant increase in expenditure. And this is not just about the price of getting, having to hire several different Hiluxes to get your staff onto site. So many things are costing much, much more. Recruitment is difficult and different from it was in the before times. And so we need to be valuing our 
those people who are actually our most valuable members of staff, those people who, we're, who are the 100% billable young junior field working staff. We have the problem there, again, different uses of the word value. There's a lot of value to the company in those people, value to the company like that, but these people are not feeling valued. So there needs to be a reset in attitudes to employment. And I know that it's happening already. I'm not saying this is something that's not happened and needs to happen immediately. So we're left in a situation where we think about what is the value that we give and what is our defense of the profession that we have, what we have made. I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much.